Okay. Today we continue studying the, um, uh, the, the consequences of the Cauchy um, integral formula for holomorphic functions, and uh, this is something I have to tell you before continuing. Remember that we have characterized the sets where the closed curves uh, we are interested in are the good curves. So simply connected domains are in fact good. Any closed curve can be deformed is homotopy to a constant. This is one of the characterization of simply connected sets in the plane and in general. Then for the plane, we have also the characterization that the complement in the extended plane is connected. This is only for plane domains. But then we have also domains which are not simply connected. For instance, you take an analysis, you take a, a domain like this with several holes, this is not simply connected. However, we can extend the formula for curves which somehow behave well. So we give this definition. We define, well first, we define a cycle, like in homology, okay? A cycle is the sum of closed some regular, sufficiently regular, rectified or whatever, curves, okay? Uh, sum in the sense of homology, so you have this closed curve here, alpha. There may be this closed curve, beta. When I say two alpha plus and minus beta, I mean this two times and then this. Okay? A closed curve starting from a, the same starting point. This is a generalization of that. So normally we, we define sums of curves by juxtaposition, okay? You put one curve, you move along the curve, and then how many times you move, you put an, uh, the coefficient in front, and then you choose the other with an orientation. The sign, is, the sign minus means that the orientation is reverse instead of the serve, okay? Okay. So we have a cycle, which is a generalization of closed curve. That's just it's a matter, of, okay, of terminology. And it was Artin, Emil Artin, it's a famous mathematician, who discovered that there is a very important characterization of those curves which are important for the Cauchy formula. Because, well, we consider normally circles, and this is an example of a very simple cycle. Okay, and locally this works fine, but then in general you can have something which is strange. So, in this domain, which is not simply connected, this example, okay, this is a stupid example. This curve is not a curve which can be shrunk to a point. But these two, alpha and beta here, they can. So, it's not true that any closed curve in a non simply connected domain cannot be homotopic to a constant. So what is the characterization? Well, the characterization is the, the following. So to give this the definition, a cycle is, this is homologous to zero and this domain, call it omega, okay, in omega, if and only if the index, a cycle gamma, okay, cycle now, now is, an, for a cycle we have also the extension of the notion of index, okay, by considering the integral several times Okay, along the, sep the, 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 the curves, okay, which, which form the cycle. So if this is zero for any A, which does not belong to omega, okay, this is a characterization. And we can characterize, in fact, 
those uh, domains for which this is true for any A inside and outside. So if so, that omega is simply connected if and only if for any cycle we have that n gamma a is zero. So n for any cycle is homologous to zero. Sorry, is homologous in omega. So if you want, this is another characterization of simply connected domains. Okay. So what I'm saying is that, well, we're not very much interested in this uh, generalization, but since we are more, uh, we want to focus our attention to the local behavior. However, I want to just, just to, to keep the, the information somehow more general. <coughs> I want to say that it is possible to, um, to extend the Cauchy formula for those curves in general domains which are homologous to zero. Okay? So, for instance, any closed uh, curve in a simply connected domain is perfect, but for other domains which are not simply connected, we have to check. Say. Okay? Good. And so the general form I was. I'm, I'm just sketching you the idea as the, the, the for this following general formulation of Cauchy formula is the following. So if F is is holomorphic and omega and gamma is homologous to zero in omega. Gamma is a cycle. Then the integral of a gamma of fz dz is zero. So if f is a holomorphic function and gamma is any any cycle modulus to zero, we have this. And remember that this was enough to define a primitive, which was analytic, and then all the other consequences. Huh? Just to make a small remark, for real valid function of one real variable. Continuity is a sufficient condition to guarantee the existence of a primitive, even less. But continuity is enough. So is continuity a sufficient condition for holomorphic, sorry, for complex valid functions to have a primitive? The answer is no. You have to require the function to be holomorphic. Okay? If we restrict our class of function to holomorphic, which are, of course, con continuous, they have more than continuous, then we have this characterization. Okay? So uh, continuity is not a sufficient condition. For existence of a primitive functions function of a complex valued function of complex variable. And I invite you to think about this, OK? Good. And now, as I said last time, before continuing in the investigation of 
zeros and singularities of holomorphic functions. Let me go back to the Cauchy formula. And this very general uh, Z, right? Right? And so, in particular, we have used this uh, formula in the case that gamma is a circle centered at Z or at A or whatever and prove that any function uh, which is holomorphic is, in fact, complex analytic. Okay, remember this. We have also characterized and calculated the <coughs> coefficient of the power series expansions in terms of the nth derivative of the function f at the point a central. Okay? So the natural question, remember that there was a, a lemma we used. Huh? Lemma just to calculate the integral of the limit as the limit of the integrals, right? And this was done because the functions involved in our calculations were all continuous and the limit was uniform, right? This is a general statement. Now, what I want to do is, is it possible to have an expression of the derivatives of f in terms of uh, the integral formula like the, this one, like similar to this one? Right? What are the hypotheses I have to use to, to ask in order to have? So if we were allowed to do the following, it's natural to think that, well, if I differentiate on the left-hand side in this expression, well, I might differentiate. Of course, I can differentiate on the right-hand side. But what is the next step? Well, the idea is to pass the symbol of the der derivation inside the inside the, um, the integral somehow, right, with respect to z. So that here would come out xi minus z to the power minus 2, right, and, the, and so on and so forth. So the answer in general is yes, you can do this. And I can use the same notation I have here. Assume that, well, this, <coughs> in fact, is a proposition which is more general than what I'm doing. And the only assumption we are, we are uh, taking is that the function, which, is, which appears here, has to be continuous of the curve. So notation is as follow. Take uh, phi continuous on gamma, gamma curve. It's a curve, not necessarily cloud. It's a curve. And define fn of z to be the integral over gamma xi xi minus z to the power n dxi. So this family of function, because it depends on n, right? The sequence of is in fact is then say for any n fn of z is differential, is complex differentiable or holomorphic, but I want to show that, well, there is a derivative, right, in this complex sense, or holomorphic. And the derivative of fn with respect to z is and time f n plus 1 c. All right? So if I show this proposition, which is more general, and I apply this to the case we are interested in, we have an expression of the derivatives of a holomorphic function in terms of the adapted Cauchy integral formula, which means that so if this proposition is correct, then this would imply that nth derivative of f is 1 over 2 pi i and gamma c n factorial 
integral over gamma f xc, xc minus z to the power n xc. Uh, sorry, n plus 1, sorry. Sure. Right? Now, let us prove this proposition, which is, as, I, as you can see, it's very general. Hmm? So let's go to the proof. So first we prove that the function f1, so we we'll prove it by induction. Okay, I remember that I defined this function, okay, I, I copy it, okay. Integral over gamma Okay, it's an integral function depending on n. Okay, and phi s continuous. Along with the curve gamma. Good. Now, we'll prove it by induction. So the first step is to prove that f1. For f1, the formula I have to prove is correct. So we prove first that f1 is continuous, OK? If, if, it, if a 1 were not continuous, then, well, there is something which is not correct, OK? So I consider f1 of z. And f1 of z is minus f1 of z0 is the integral of a gamma p of xi, xi minus z plus, oh, sorry, minus the integral over gamma c naught big C, right? This is the definition. Now observe that this can be also written as the integral over gamma, okay, of fix C, C minus Z, C minus Z naught, C minus Z naught, why? Well, <clears throat> you multiply, you put the, the, the common denominator, you multiply this times c minus z naught, and then I have minus c minus minus z, so plus z. So z appears here, minus z naught appears here, and c times phi cancel. Okay? So this is the expression. And of course, this factor does not depend on C, so it can be taken out from, from the symbol of integral. So this is Z minus Z naught times the integral of a gamma P of C, C minus Z, C minus Z naught, big C. Now, I have a curve, and of course, what I'm, I'm taking here is that, well, I didn't say it properly, but what I'm saying that z is not on the curve. Otherwise, this is not reasonable, right? Like in the formula we are considering we're in the center or inside the circle or the curve or outside, depends on what we're interested in, but not on the curve, correct? Because otherwise, here we have something which is zero at a certain t, huh? right? So it means that z is here, for instance, and z naught is here. And this is gamma, right? So take delta, uh, delta being the distance of z naught. Take delta to be the distance. from gamma to z naught, so this is maybe this. It's the length of this segment, right? And we can take also z close to z naught. This is local, OK? We will make then the limit as z tends to z naught, correct? So we are interested to a neighborhood of z naught. So that we can take not a z like this, but a z very close. Such that z minus z naught is smaller than delta over two. 
that T is uh, also Z minus C is greater than delta over 2. Okay? When C, of course, belongs to gamma. Right? So I have the freedom of choosing a small neighborhood. So I, I give you another sketchy. So, so I take a neighborhood of Z naught in such a way that any point here has a distance from the curve, which is at least this half a distance. Right? So now I have this. The modulus of the difference is small or equal to z minus e naught times the integral of xc, xc minus e naught times xc minus z, right? Xc. We are using the inequality. Hmm? So the integral of a product is the product of the, in, uh, sorry, the integral of the, mm, sorry, the, the modulus of the product is, we're saying something, something completely wrong, but the modulus of the product is equal to the product of the moduli, but then we apply also the inequality we use several times for the integral of, uh, so the modulus of the integral is smaller or equal to the integral of the module. Now, and this can be made smaller than d minus z naught times. Well, we have a gamma. Gamma is a curve. So it is the image of a closed, uh, it is an image under, a, a, say, sufficiently regular, so at least continuous, okay, a closed interval. So it is a complex subset. Huh? So phi of c is a maximum on gamma. So I can take m, m being the maximum of modulus of phi of c. Phi, I remember uh, that phi is continuous on gamma. And gamma is a closed. And now I have that this is 2 over d squared because of the inequalities I have here, right? z minus c naught is smaller than delta over 2, and c minus z, or as a modulus greater of delta over 2, so that we have the reciprocal, right? Now, this number here is smaller than a constant times z minus z naught, okay, so that we have that f1 is continuous. And this, you see, this is a constant which is independent in some sense, okay? So we take the limit when z tends to z naught, and we see that, well, actually, f prime of z of F1 of Z, which is this, or the limit, say, when calculated Z0, okay, more correctly this way, is the limit as Z tends to Z0 of F1 of Z minus F1 of Z0 over Z minus Z0. This is the limit as z tends to z naught of what? After dividing by z minus z naught in the expression here, which we use in this estimate, we are left with the integral of a gamma phi of c, c minus z, c minus z naught, dx c. And when z tends to z naught, since we are considering uniform convergence, okay, this is the integral of a gamma of phi of c c minus e naught square, big C, which is precise f2 of z naught. So the first step in our induction proof is done. Let me just remember that this is the fifth page, right? So now assume that, um, assume that uh, we have this uh, proposition showed for the case Fn. I want to prove it for the case Fn plus 1, right? So 
assume the proposition is valid for n, we want to prove it for n plus 1, right? So, I consider this as I did before. Take f n of z minus f n of z naught and write it explicitly. This is by definition is, so I write it the integral over gamma fix c, c minus z to the power n dx c minus the integral over gamma v over c c minus z naught to the power n dx c. And I, and I consider another expression I want to use, okay. So I um, well, I apply what this. I write this, this first term, and this equivalent way. V of C, and I C minus Z to the power N minus 1, and then I put C minus Z naught. Okay? Then minus V of C, C minus Z to the power N times C minus Z naught times Z minus Z naught and then dx C. Let's see if it's correct. So I put everything together. So I have Z minus Z naught here and I have for what? Uh, sorry, Z minus Z naught, right? Uh, maybe Maybe it's better to put it this way. So, like in the previous case, I, yes, I have to multiply times C minus Z here, right? So, I have, yes, should be. So, I have C minus Z naught, C minus Z, sorry, and then I have uh, minus uh, so, we have to cancel this, right? So, as we did before, let me check. So, okay. Let me check. I have C, like C minus Z, and then I have. Uh, minus, and this is C minus Z times power N, Z, uh, C minus Z naught, minus C, Z minus Z naught, over right. Yes. And this is what? Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, well, I'm just considering something wrong because I have the plus here, right? Let me check. This is C minus Z naught, and then I multiply times C minus Z, C minus Z, minus Z cancels Z here, and I have C minus Z naught remains, huh? which cancels this. So this is correct with a plus instead of a minus. Let, let me just sketch here what I have phi times C minus Z, then plus phi Z minus Z naught, and then I have C minus Z to the power N, C minus Z naught, C minus Z naught cancel, so this is phi of C times C minus Z to the power N. Right? So that this expression is like this. And then I have a minus here. Sorry. Minus, remember, we have also this second part here. So the 
second part is here. So, I put a plus here minus the integral of phi of c, c minus e naught to the power n big c. So, in other words, I have that f n of z minus f n of z naught is in fact the integral of a gamma v of c over c minus z to the power n minus 1 times c minus z naught minus v of c over c minus z naught to the power n and then I have plus v of c over c minus z to the power n z minus z naught over c minus z naught integrate over c. Are you still following the calculations or not? Just some, well, this and this is the integral of phi of c, c minus z to the power n dx c. And I invite you to verify it. So if you put the same denominator, you have to multiply this time c minus z, then you sum minus, then you sum uh, phi of c, z minus z naught. So what is left is phi of c, c minus z naught over c minus z n times z, c minus z naught, which cancel out. Okay, so it is the same. Right? Okay, now this is also. Okay, I split. I consider this difference under the sign of integral and then this. So this is integral of a gamma v of c, c minus z naught time c minus z to the power n minus 1 minus v of c. And I write it this way, right? c minus z naught the power n minus 1 dc plus the integral of phi of c, c minus z to the power n times z minus z naught over c minus z naught dc. Right? All right. So I'm sorry that I have to continue another new slide. But then you should recognize in here something which reminds what we are what we have here, right? Something very similar to this. So in particular, if I consider if I divide everything times uh, z minus z naught, all right? This is, well, the integral of a gamma, c, c minus z naught, c minus z to the power n minus 1 minus c, c minus z naught, c minus z naught to the power n, dx c over c minus e naught plus the integral v of c, c minus z to the power n times c minus z naught dx c. Wait. 
for something which is missing here, min minus 1, right? Is that what I'm, I'm doing or something which is uh, not convincing you? All right, so I, I divided times z minus e naught on the left hand side. I have z minus e naught here, and the, the factor z minus e naught is cancelled here, right? So now I should recognize here something which reminds what? The incremental ratio of this is f n minus 1, z minus f, n minus 1, z naught over, sorry, this is z minus z naught. Hmm? And then I have here something which is the integral, let's see. right? So, this, uh, because of, I have this, right? This expression, correct? And here I have this as an expression, correct? But I have also C minus Z naught, right? C minus Z naught is here. You see this? So I have to consider one and more stuff. And so this would give us something which is when I take the limit n times f n z, which is not what I want, right? And this would converge to plus f and plus 1 of z naught, right? So I have to, uh, sorry, this is n minus 1, right? This is something which converges to this, right? According to our hypothesis, the hypothesis is that the Right? This is the statement for the case n, and we are assuming it valid for the case n minus 1, right? On the right hand side here, we have n plus 1, right? But here, if you think a little bit, we can rephrase it in terms of, of these functions uh, fn minus 1 or fn. I have to, sorry, I have to check it a bit more carefully about the index. Maybe. Maybe you are lost in the notation, but uh, no, this is correct. This is n minus one, right? Correct. This part here, but we have also the integral, huh? right? One over c minus z naught dx c. So this notation is a bit horrible. So let me rewrite it this way and use this notation. So I finally have f and z minus f and z naught over z minus z naught and I have integral of gamma, then V of C, C minus Z to the power N minus 1 minus V of C, C minus Z naught N minus 1. Then I have 1 over C minus Z naught, which is the common factor. And then I divide times Z minus Z naught, right? Plus the integral of gamma of field C, C 
xi minus z to the power n times xi minus z naught dx c. So, when I take the limit, okay, this is in fact <coughs> what I was writing before, okay, this is f n minus 1, sorry, f minus 1 xi and f minus 1 xi naught, z naught, f minus 1 z, f minus 1 z naught, right. And so, this tends to, when taking the limit, f n minus 1, f n z naught, which is by definition f prime of n minus 1 z naught. This is by by induction. Which is the integral over gamma C over C minus C naught to the power n n minus one, right? So, when I then take also this in consideration, I have plus 1. Hmm? And on the other uh, uh, term, which appears here, I have this is the integral over xi of xi minus z naught to the power m. So, n minus 1 plus 1 gives you n times f n plus 1 at z naught. So, when I take the limit as z tends to z naught, I have that f prime of n of z naught is in fact, is in fact what I have to prove, that is to say, this. So, f prime n of z is the limit as z tends to z naught of f n of z minus f n of z naught over z minus z naught and this is the limit as z tends to z naught of uh, z naught sorry of this right n minus 1 integral over gamma p of c c minus c naught plus this is not a limit I already taken the limit on the right hand side so n minus 1 plus 1 is n times integral over gamma p of c c minus to the power n, sorry, n plus 1, n plus 1, which is n times f n plus 1 of z naught by definition. So, we have actually the formula we were looking for, <coughs> the nth derivative of a function which is represented in this internal way is sorry is given by a similar expression integral over same curve gamma of n factorial of p of xi xi minus z to the power n plus one dx and this is what we were looking for. Okay. Now, sorry for this longer calculations, but I cannot find another way to show it to you, right? So, in some sense, what we have shown is that any holomorphic function and its higher derivatives have a Cauchy integral formulation in terms of what? Same functions along the curve over a power 
of xi minus z, hmm? up to a constant, of course. Now, this is just for the sake of completeness, but I want to focus our attention to the zeros. Remember the last time we have shown that holomorphic function either is identically zero or the set of zero cannot have a point of accumulation, right? And this implied, implies the identity principle. So if two functions which are holomorphic in a domain agree on a set which has a limit point, accumulation point, for instance, an open set, then necessarily they co coincide hmm, elsewhere. And this is also known as uh, um, uh, uniqueness theorem in some sense for holomorphic function of, uh, uh, it is a, a unique way to prolong a, cur uh, a, a, a holomorphic function. If it is defined locally, and then you know that it, another function can be, so another, so the function can be extended to some small neighborhood of the points of the boundary, then the function itself is extended. And it's uh, coincide with the previous one in the, in the, in the, the section. Okay, good. Now, yes, I want, today I want to, well, to, yes, to, what, to tell you something more about this, this, um, this zeros, and in particular, let me show you that given a holomorphic function, in omega such that f of a is zero, um, but f of z is different from zero. So f of z is different for some z. What I want to say is that f is not identically zero, okay? Then there exists an n depending on a, an integer, such that f of z is z minus a times n a times g of z, where g is holomorphic. and does not vanish at a. Okay, so this uh, enforces the, the idea that, well, in fact, holomorphic function can be considered as generalization of polynomials. If you have a root of a polynomial, then you have also a factor, and then you consider also the so-called algebraic multiplicity of the root of a polynomial, right? While this is not true for uh, um, real valid functions, there are functions which vanish at the one point, but th there is no integer or in any linear factor times something, okay? Because the function vanishes at this, this point. Z naught, say, for example. There is not necessarily an n such that z minus z naught to the power n times g of x is equal to f of x. But for holomorphism, this is the case. And in fact, well, of course, this gives this uh, imply so this um, definition follows from the, this property uh, and say an a is the multiplicity. of the zero a for f, of course, right? So the proof is, of course, a consequence. It's an obvious consequence 
of of the characterization we have last time. So, remember that we have proved that well, either the function which is holomorphic is identically zero, the set or, right, the sets of um, um, zeros has an accumulation point. And the third characterization is that there is a point such that all the derivatives of the holomorphic function at A vanish. Okay. Now assume that N is the largest integer such that the uh, nth derivative at a is 0 for any n smaller or equal to n a minus 1. Well, I'm sure that the function is, well, I'm assuming that the function is not identically 0. So I'm sure that at the point a, you cannot have all the derivative is vanishing. So I consider the an A I want to define as the largest integer such that all the derivatives calculated at A, evaluated at A, are zero up to an A. Okay? And then I define G of Z to be, this is a function I have to define, right? To be Z minus A to the power minus n a times f z. This is for z different from a, and g of a being the nth derivative, the n a derivative of f at a over n factorial, which is the nth coefficient in the power expansion of f, right? What do we have? We have that, well, G of Z is certainly holomorphic in omega minus A because, well, F of Z is holomorphic. The, this function is not holomorphic only at Z equal to A, but elsewhere it's holomorphic. So we have a product of two holomorphic functions. And we know that the Leibniz rule holds, so we can say immediately that G of Z is holomorphic. Okay? But remember, because an A is the largest integer such that this is the case, then we also have that the limit as Z tends to A of Z minus A times G of Z, this is zero. Correct? So the function can be actually extended. Huh? Remember, that it has only one singularity. Remember the, the, the generalization of Gurusa theorem? This hypothesis guarantees that the function, in fact, is bounded. Okay? And if you look at the power expansion of f of z and of g of z, the two functions, in fact, coincide up to this. So we have the g of z is sorry, times z minus a to the power n a is in fact f of z. And this number is not zero because we are assuming that all the coefficients are, so only the derivative of f at a vanish but not at an a. So this is not zero, so we have the, the theorem. So any holomorphic function which, has, which is not identically zero and as a zero can be written as a factor z minus a, as a zero at z naught or at a, z minus a, z minus z naught to the certain power times a function which is holomorphic and not vanishing at the same zero. So if this were a polynomial case, 
is what we are obvious. This is the, the multiplicity, right, of the, of, the, the, of the root A, okay. The other term is the part which does not vanish, okay, good. So we have this definition. Now, assume that the function has in fact more than one zero. So assume that have holomorphic in omega has the one the m zeros. So it, which means that f of z j is zero and j varies between one and m. So not necessarily one a zero, but several zeros, right? So if we repeat the same argument used before, well, we can say, well, you see, I have that this factor can be taken out, and I put n1, the multiplicity of z1, this exponent, and I have times g of z, but g of z, of course, does not vanish at z1, because this is the hypothesis but probably vanish at C2 or C3 and so on and so forth. So I have this factors times a function, I call it G of Z again, which is not vanishing at C1, Z2, and Zm, so it's not vanishing at all. Hmm? Correct? Now, let us make some exercise uh, in, in derivatives and apply Leibniz rule several times. We have a product here. If I calculate a derivative, well, the product has a derivative which is related but in a specific way by the Leibniz rule to the, the sum of the products of the derivatives, right? So I take the derivative notation is like this, and I start differentiating this, okay? So I call it n1 z minus z1, correct? Times, and I want to call this, say, g n1 z, okay? And then plus, I have z minus z1 to the power n1 times the derivative correct this is Leibniz truth but then this part here is as before the derivative of this times gz2 plus something so the pro the procedure goes like this and if you do calculation in a row, in a sense, okay, repeat, 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 repeat. At the end of the story, you have this, okay, n1, z minus z1, n minus 1, n1 minus 1, sorry, times g1. G N one Z plus I write it this way, okay? And two Z minus Z two and two minus one G N two Z plus plus N M Z minus Z M and M minus one G M Z what is GMZ? It's G. In the previous notation, it was G. So the last part, right? And plus, I have Z minus Z1 and 1, Z minus Z2 and 2. 
g prime of z right so if i consider f prime of z over f of z which in general is not something reasonable but i'm considering well where this is meaningful that is to say where z does not vanish so except for the point z1 z2 zm i can always consider this well you see well take this okay first summon remember this is everything in the function except the first factor after derivation okay so if you divide times f what is left it, everything cancel so g f z minus z2 to the power n minus 2 z minus z3 and so on and what is left is z minus z1 to the power n1 correct so i have n1 times z minus z1 to the power minus 1. So I write it this way. Similarly, I have n2 and nm, z minus zm, plus, and the last part is g prime of z over g of z. Correct? So you probably see this much better for one point for one zero, right? And then you repeat it several times. Do you want it to see it in detail or is it sufficiently clear at this stage? Is it? So assume that you are, well, just taking z minus z1 times g of z. After the, after the first derivative, you have this times this, right? And this is g. This is the g, okay? This is the g and one. You then consider the, the ratio f prime over f. Your g and one cancel here, but you have z minus z one to the power n minus one. So one factor comes out from, and here g prime over g is the part which reminds. Okay. So after repeating this procedure for all the zeros, you are left with this. And here it is interesting because you have precisely what is needed to calculate the index of the zeros, right? Times the multiplicities, the each multiplicity for each zero. And then if you think what you are asked to do now is to calculate the integral of this, this ratio over a, a closed curve gamma, and up to a constant one, so up to two pi i, here you have what? The index of z1 with respect to the curve gamma times n1. The, the, curve, the, 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 the index of zm times nm with respect to gamma, not the index of, NM, of zm with respect to gamma. Sure, you are correct. It, it, what is missing here is uh, well, z minus z minus z one to the power n one, right? Yes, yeah, sure. So. So, uh, well, I didn't say it, but what I meant when I said GN1 was everything which is not in the factor of Z1 or containing Z1, okay? So everything which is not in the factor containing Z2, right? Don't know what is on the right, what is in the, in the expression without, okay? You are correct. There is some, but if I say the GNJ is F of Z over z minus zj to the power nj, I'm correct. So I'm canceling the factor z minus zj in the expression, right? I didn't, I didn't, meant, I didn't, I didn't want to, to mean the, the factors on the right. 
even though the first is pro probably the misleading, the misleading example, because in fact what is left is the right, the right factors. When I start from the second, I, I consider the first, and from the third to the end. Okay, but at, at the end of the story, I'm, I'm, I arrive to this. Okay. This is the G, the G, the G. This is a G. This is the G I have here. Should be. Because, well, when I finish considering all this, I have just to differentiate this. No, not this. GM is not G only. But GM is G. It's not G only. It's G. Yes, G and M, probably. G and M means everything but. Oh, you're right. Yes. You're right. You're right. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's why you are, yeah, sure, sure. The two notations are not, okay. This, but this is correct. Then I consider everything which is, okay. So, correct. So, if I'm, I'm taking this, this is not correct. Thank you. All right, but when I divide, what is left for this last summon is just the derivative of G, over G. And this does not give any contribution for the calculation of the index of this ratio because the function g is not vanishing in omega. So that if I take 1 over 2 pi i, the integral over gamma, gamma closed curve of f prime of z over f of z, dz, this is n1 and gamma, c1 plus nm and gamma, zm. And this ratio here gives you certainly zero contribution in the integral because the function g has no zero, right? It's holomorphic and has no zeros. Okay? Good. Now, let me see how we can apply this fact. One simple example. So, well, consider. I don't know if it's a good idea to start with this, but consider, well, probably this is one case we have to study, okay? So we are calculating this integral along the circle center at the origin, radius 2. And I notice that what? You see, this is that the numerator is the derivative of the denominator. So if I differentiate z squared plus z plus 1, this is precisely 2z plus 1. So, okay. Now, this is something which will be use, useful again. So, in general, assume that I consider the integral over a curve gamma, capital gamma, of 1 over w dw. This gives you what? The index of a gamma of the point zero. Correct? How do we calculate this? Well, gamma is a curve. But assume this curve is precisely 
the image of a curve times a holomorphic composed with a holomorphic function f. Hmm? So, this number here is what the integral uh, of this can be and gamma is for instance 0 to pi is a alpha beta into c. Okay. And I substitute, right? So, I have f of gamma t prime over f of gamma t and gamma prime time dt. Correct? And so, what we are doing is that if w of t is f of gamma of t, we are considering the indexes, the index of the zeros of f. Right. With multiplicities. So to calculate this, well, this can be done. You substitute, you put everything inside, and you make a lot of uh, calculation. But if you have in mind that, well, this is the derivative of the function. Okay. So if you want, you can write this also integral over gamma of f of z, f prime of z over f of z dz. And this is known to be the sum of nj and gamma zj and zj's are in the zero set of f. So the multiplicity times the index. This number, this sum is the finite sum because the number of zero is finite. Okay, you say, well, if the curve is a closed curve, then consider the, the zeros which are inside. And of course, the curve gamma cannot pass through one of these zeros. So, okay, the bounded region, if gamma is a Jordan curve or something like this, it is bounded and unbounded. In the bounded region, the contribution is not important for this calculation because the, the index is zero, right? Inside the bounded region, there can be only a finite number of zeros. If they were infinite because of Wolfsano Weistra theorem, it would be an accumulation point to the boundary, up to the bound to the closure. So that, uh, either inside, it's not allowed, or to the boundary, not allowed as well. So the, on the right hand side we have a finite contribution in this uh, summation. In particular here, if we apply the calculation, well, the zeros here are at most two. Hmm? Well, we have just to check if they are inside or outside this curve. So inside, say in, in the bounded component or in the unbounded component, and then this integral becomes simply 2 pi i times this number here. So, well, of course, I forgot 2 pi i. Huh? 2 pi i is missing. But our, so the zeros we are here is, well, take the standard formula minus 1 plus or minus square root of 1 minus 4, so minus 3 over right 2, which is the two conjugate numbers hmm, whose modulus is smaller than two, right? So we have two simple zeros. The curve is, uh, the curve gamma is, is a circle, so the number of times uh, when, um, the number of times the, the curve Wraps or is winding uh, is one for each, so we have two, right? Simple zeros of one times one plus one plus one times one. So this integral is four pi i without making any calculation. This is very simple example and an application of a more general theory about the integration, knowing something about the coefficients of the zeros and so the multiplicity. Yes. 
you do not see this, right. And I also add this. Of course, the fact that we are considering a zero is just by accident because zero is simply to, to define. But if you want to be more general, you can do the following. So consider f of z and take uh, f of z, sorry, minus alpha, alpha being a complex number. And define this function to be g of z. This is still comp sorry, holomorphic. Sorry, if f is holomorphic, in omega, so is g. Now, what can I say about the zeros of g? Well, this corresponds to the number of times f takes the values alpha, right? So g vanishes at any point z such that f of z is equal to alpha. This is the only possibility. So if I consider 1 over 2 pi i, the integral of g prime of z over g of z, this is what? The number of zeros with multiplicities sum together. But this is also 1 over 2 pi i over gamma of, well, f prime of z, actually over f of z minus alpha dz, right? Because the derivative of f and the derivative of g agree whereas f and g do not. So in this way, I can say, well, this is summation of n j and gamma, say, z j, where z j are such that f of z j is alpha. So this counts the number of inverse images of alpha with multiplicity. In fact, there are zeros of this function g. Right? Now, this, okay, this is 16, sorry. This, together with the previous consideration, will give us something important. Now, take f, this is a proposition which will be useful. So, take f holomorphic in VAR. So, in the ball center of tail or radius r. So we are considering the very, in some sense, generic but very local case. Okay, we take the, the, the disk center of tail. So for instance, this works fine for any <coughs> power expansion uh, center of tail and whose radius convergence is r, right? And define for a the center f of a to be alpha, okay? So, so if f of z minus alpha has a zero of multiplicity m equivalently, if the problem f minus 1 of alpha has m inverse images, right, in some sense, in L, in A, okay, condense in A, okay, as m root, as m inverse images in R, in A, okay. Can you, can you see this? So, this is a, well, for sure, A is one of these zeros. They're not necessarily different. No, I'm not saying they are different. But I, I imagine that this zero has a multiplicity M, okay? So, 
They might, might be extra zeros. But, well, we want to say that in A, this, this function has, well, in, in um, sorry, what I'm saying the more correctly is this. All right? That's what I want to say. So I have A here, the radius R, and I have alpha here, and F of A is alpha. Well, there exist an uh, epsilon and positive delta such that if beta belongs to the ball centered at A of radius delta, then F of Z minus beta has precisely M simple zeros in B A epsilon. Do you understand what I mean? So the function is defined in this ball center of A. F of alpha F, sorry, f of a is alpha. So I restrict my consideration to a small neighborhood of alpha and take the value beta inside this small neighborhood of the value alpha. Then I consider the problem of solving f of z minus beta, so looking for solution of the problem. How many z are there z's and in the domain of definition such that f of z is beta? And the answer is yes, and I can be more precise. I can take delta so small, so the radius so small, in such a way that there exists also a neighborhood of A, where the, the zeros are precisely m as many as the uh, multiplicity of the solution of the zero A for the for the problem f z minus alpha, and they are all simple. Simple means the multiplicity of each of them is one, which means that locally you can have some injectivity, right, of solutions. Okay, so how do we see this? Well, we just sketch the ideas, okay? So this is number 17. First of all, just okay, to start with, let me remind you the zeros of f of z minus alpha are isolated. They cannot accumulate, right? So, in particular, um, we can choose positive epsilon in such a way that f of z minus alpha has no solution in this. D, I put a, a dot in, in the in D A two epsilon. So epsilon, of course, has to be smaller than <coughs> one half of the radius of convergence. And what I mean with this dot is the following. This is a set of z and c such that z minus a is smaller than 2 epsilon but different from a. So I'm using this fact. a is certainly a zero of this function, g of z, call it g of z, f of z minus alpha, right? But zeros are, for holomorphic are isolated. 
They cannot accumulate. So there is a neighborhood of any zero which does not contain any other zero. All right, good. And this is the first condition, I'm assuming so, because. And the second condition is the same choice of epsilon. We can also take that f prime of z is different from zero and the same neighborhood. Why can we do this? Well, first of all, the derivative, sorry, yes, the derivative of f is a holomorphic function as, as well. So its zeros are isolated. So either f1 at a is zero, which means that the multiplicity of a is greater than one. Also, if it is zero, then we apply the fact that f prime is holomorphic, so the the zeros of f prime have to be isolated. So we can intersect, if you want, the smallest neighborhood uh, of A in such a way that this is different from zero and this is different from zero. Or if it is um, different from zero by continuity, it is not zero in a neighborhood of A. So in any case, I can make this choice of a neighborhood in such a way in the, the, in the punch disk centered at A and radius 2 epsilon, okay, this is just a matter of notation, but so a small neighborhood without considering point A, we have both conditions satisfied. Okay, so what we'll do is the following. I will consider beta in a neighborhood of delta in such a way that the curve we're considering, the, 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 the circle centered at A of radius epsilon, does not intersect, of course, alpha. And beta is chosen in such a small neighborhood so that it is in the same component of the complement of gamma, of f of gamma. And we calculate, and then we will calculate on Wednesday, <laughs> we will calculate then the indexes of the two, uh, of the, uh, with respect to this curve, of the two points, alpha and beta. And we show that this is the same. It has to be the same because they are in the same complement of gamma. And making the calculation will show what we want. But remember that this additional hypothesis guarantees that the function is in fact injective. So the numbers of zeros will be m, like the, the, the multiplicity of a as a zero, but so each, each zero has to be a simple zero. And I think that I stop here.